Um, I thought I would cover the opening salvos of the battle between the nanny state and the big tech and big tech corporations. So this is something like the timeless conflict between the poisonous spider and the scorpion. You don't know which of them to root for, you hope both of them lose, but you're not sure what's going to happen to you out of it. So this article is mainly talking about the online harms bill, which is where all of this is manifesting in UK law. This is an excellent job that uh, Josh did of covering the groundwork about this time last year uh, and now it's it's come back into circulation for various reasons that we'll get on with. So just to give you a refresher about what the online harms bill is, if we can scroll down a bit. So according to this piece of legislation which is proposed and not yet effective, Ofcom, the regulatory body for telecommunications in the UK, will be granted powers to fine companies up to either 10% of their annual global turnover or £18 million, whichever is higher, if a company is deemed to be failing in their duty of care to protect vulnerable users. The bill would apply to any company that hosts user-generated content accessible to UK viewers, with the exception of comment sections of news websites and small business product or service reviews. This could result in technology companies receiving ludicrously large fines alongside requirements to publish audits if standards are not met. For example, based on its most recent earnings reports last year, Facebook could face fines up to $7.1 billion and YouTube's owner Google $16.1 billion. This is not chump change. Even for a company of this size, that's quite a fine. The proposed bill introduces a novel element to pre-existing legislation. Technology companies are to be legally compelled to regulate content that is currently considered legal but harmful, such as images depicting self-harm or promoting eating disorders. And that's all, that'll be just where it ends, I'm sure. I mean, we, I remember reading, I think it was Baroness Warsi's uh, document in relation to this. Mm -hmm. She had Pepe memes in there as like symbols of the far right that we need to stamp down on. Mm. Pepe memes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, like the meme of what the left are screaming about is actually in government reports from a conservative lord. Yep. I mean, who determines what is harmful in this case? Determ Pepe memes are harmful, but legal. <laughs> ah, so this, this comes as, as governments are increasingly recognizing Facebook, Google, and Twitter, and Amazon to be, I would say, extremely powerful players in the political arena, with revenues larger than the GDP of some countries. And just to illustrate that point, if we pull up the next slide, uh, Google posted a revenue of $180 billion in 2020. This would place them the 55th country in the world between Kazakhstan and Hungary if revenue were GDP. In real terms, Google probably has much more wealth and power than Hungary. Then there are 140,000 employees at Google, so if you were to calculate GDP per capita or revenue per capita, Google would knock all the other countries well out of the park. It makes $1.3 million of revenue per employee, which is over 10 times higher than the GDP per capita of Luxembourg. This gives you, an, it gives you an idea of how much wealth and power is concentrated in these companies. And that's without going into what they do and how they police the online realm. So governments clearly want a slice of that cash and they're using the toxic effects of social media corporations on online discourse as the excuse to do so. So moving back to the online harms bill, in October this year, Conservative MP David Ames was assassinated, prompting bizarre calls for an extension to the online harms bill. Um, we have a quote here. Conservative former minister has urged Boris Johnson to toughen up the online harms bill as he proposed David's law in memory of Sir David Ames. Mark Francois, MP for Rayleigh and Wickford, Conservative, said Sir David had become increasingly concerned about the toxic environment that MPs were having to operate in and suggested a ban on social media anonymity to tackle the issue. Sir David Ames was knifed to death in Leon C on Friday while holding a constituency surgery. Ali Harbi Ali, 25, was arrested on suspicion of his murder and remains in custody. They have a lot, a lot of Twitter accounts. They, they used to tweet hurtful things at David Armis. I haven't heard of anyone treat, tweeting knives yet. Maybe that's a technical innovation that's no, just, slipped me by. We've covered it before, but it's just... It, you can glare daggers, I know that It much. is so insulting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just like, yeah, the toxic environment online killed David Armis. Mm. He wasn't killed by tweets. He was killed by an Islamist stabbed him to death in the a church the toxic environment is not the internet yep. the toxic environment is the one you're allowing to create in the uk conservatives nothing on immigration endlessly importing islamism mm -hmm. 
And then they're like, oh, no, it's, it's the internet that's the problem. Well, if you live in the Westminster bubble, that is probably where all the problems seem to be to you. But that's where you are all the time. If you go into the real world to see the real country, you'll see there are real problems here. Addressing the House of Commons during a series of tributes to Sir David on Monday, Mr Francois highlighted the vitriol faced by female MPs online, saying he was appalled by the vile misogynistic abuse directed towards elected officials on social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. Man stabbed to death, women's tweets most affected. Yep. He told the House of Commons, if the social media companies don't want to help us drain the Twitter swamp, then let's compel them to do it by law because they've had more than enough chances to do it voluntarily. I hate these people. Mm. I'm sorry, but it's, it's so insulting. Mm -hmm. So, despite the fact that online anonymity has absolutely nothing to do with this, the assassin, I believe, was radicalised by watching radical Islamists like Anjem Chowdhury on YouTube, I think we can say that, uh, and he enacted his worldview by stabbing a British MP to death in a Christian church, not posting mean tweets under an anonymous handle. Uh, personally, I think standing on someone's grave in this manner by calling the provisions David's law is disgraceful, and that's probably why the term has dropped. I haven't heard it since October. It's been quietly shelved. But moving to the present, we have a new government report aiming to toughen up the online harms bill, which is now called the Online Safety Bill. It seems to be a trend that the worse the legislation gets, the nicer the name becomes. Um, so, new offences and tighter rules. I'm going to quote this article in depth because it covers it the best out of the current outlets that have an interest. Uh, the online safety bill is seen as one of the most far-reaching attempts to date to regulate online content, which could have global implications. The first draft, published in May, put a duty of care on large social websites to remove harmful or illegal content and protect children. But it was largely left up to the tech giants themselves to police, with oversight from media regulator Ofcom. So duty of care in the British context is an interesting statement because duty of care would normally apply to, for example, a parent or guardian or a teacher who's teaching children in school. So to then apply that to social media companies like Twitter and Facebook seems to me rather concerning, but that's just my take on it. Uh, the parliamentary report calls for Ofcom to set much more explicit standards and have even greater powers to investigate and fine big tech firms. Among the many recommendations made over its 191 pages are an explicit duty for all pornography sites to make sure children cannot access them. So this is the wanking pass that they yes. were proposing, yeah. which is that British citizens should go to their local lobby <laughs> and uh, hand over their, their driving license mm -hmm. so they can get a wanking pass with a 12-digit code on it that you would then go home and type in the 12-digit code with your name attached to it yep. so you could then browse whatever you want to browse on Pornhub. Mm -hmm. Very sensible legislation. Yep, I'm sure that's very secure. Uh, scams and fraud, such as fake adverts designed to trick users, should be covered. The bill should cover not just content, but the potential harmful impact of algorithms. Well, that, that is just an incredibly broad remit. The potentially harmful impact of algorithms. I don't even know where to start there, so I'm just going to move on. It should also be expanded to cover paid-for advertising, such as those involving scams. The report also recommends that a wide range of new criminal offences should be created based on proposals from the Law Commission and carried in the bill, including promoting or stirring up violence against women or based on gender or disability. I, I don't know why they limited it there. Like, mm -hmm. why not race and uh, transgender identity and all the rest of it they usually throw in, but why mm -hmm. not? But stirring up violence against women. Well, I thought that was already a hate crime, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it, stirring up violence is a crime That's already. inciting hatred. You don't need the women part. I don't know who's throwing that in. Right. But also just the, like, if you're stirring up violence, like if you're outside a group of women and saying we should kill those women, mm -hmm. that would be the, the stock stamp example. So my feeling on this with But my... saying that this woman's a hoe. Yeah. But like that's what it's going to be used for. Mm, sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. With my experience of these sorts of committees, I can very well expect that there was a feminist group within, within these. Say one MP who's, who thinks herself as a big feminist and a supporter of women's issues has not read the legislation, has a very limited understanding of how the law actually stands, and made such a, a noise about putting this provision in that eventually they just put it in to shut her up. But that's, that's my theory on this, what we shall have to see. I imagine that's how the committees usually go. Yes. Uh, knowingly distributing seriously harmful misinformation should also be a criminal offence. Now, who's going to define harmful misinformation? What if someone has a, what if a medical doctor has a spicy 
uh, opinion on a certain issue of note in the modern era. Where well, can enjoy the prison sentence, can't he? Exactly. It does remind me of one story, though. i got to tell you because I think it's funny. Okay. There was uh, someone posting on 4chan who was just like, oh, I want to make uh, heroin or, or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was crystal meth. How do I make crystal meth? Someone gave them instructions, and the instructions would make mustard gas. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like here you go go ahead they didn't post back so either they choked it down oh god <laughs> so you know get, you know that that could be an example i mean that's sort of a stupidity test there but yeah <laughs> oh the internet what a glorious era we live in uh, another uh, possible crime that we have here don't do that <laughs> no please don't um content promoting self-harm should be made illegal again how you define promoting self-harm is interesting mm. Um, I'm going to move on from there. Uh, cyber flashing, the sending of unwanted naked images, should be illegal. Uh, now again, I think everyone would agree that the internet would probably be a nicer space if there weren't a load of naked pictures floating around. Meta, for example, has recently called for, uh, for all users to send Facebook their nudes so that Meta's algorithms can preemptively stop your nudes from being shared. But if you don't send Meta your nudes, then uh, they will not be able to prevent your nudes from being shared. <sighs> in their secure server of uh, that never gets hacked. Their little say, uh, folder over there is definitely not porn. Because we know how good Meta is at, uh, yeah. at looking after its users' security. It's not like it uses any of this information for its own personal profit. What do you make of that though? Is just mm -hmm. a, a let's say it's only on the basis of private messages, so mm. not you know scrolling through Twitter and I found a, a, a someone's dick to arrest them, but instead you know someone actually just sending you nudes. Like you can the block penises. them. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is the, the traditional solution. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what they could do to try and get around that. Like, mm. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that is the solution rather than legislating it. Yeah, I think that's that's the best way. But it is uh, it is tricky, and we'll get in towards the end of this segment some of the more, the more real conversations to have about this rather than just the ridiculous ideas that our social media overlords come up with on one side and our, our state overlords come up with on the other. Uh, so... so also, deliberately sending flashing images to those with epilepsy with the goal of causing a seizure is also illegal. Now, I do wonder whether Christmas lights are going to be made illegal because uh, my neighbours have got quite the display up at the moment. But I do think that this is a bad thing. Whether, you, whether it's effectively translated into law or not, we shall have to wait and see. Uh, Mr. Collins said these changes would bring more offences clearly within the scope of the online safety bill, give Ofcom the power to, in law to set minimum safety standards for the services they will regulate, and to take enforcement action against companies if they don't comply. I'd also like to note that Francis Horgan, the rather suspicious Facebook whistleblower who called for a lot of censorship on these platforms, was also consulted during these parliamentary hearings. Yeah, Isn't I saw she was invited by Nadine Doris, which is incredibly disappointing to see. Yes. Yes, um, I was considering doing a, a feature on Nadine Doris here because she's got quite a story as to how she got here. She's essentially the the main, the, the chief of this whole process at this mm. point. She's not the chairman of the report, but she's the new digital secretary. So She was put in charge of culture and digital. And all exactly. That, which she looked very promising and then has just done what? Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing useful. So uh, another major addition is the recommendation that tech firms must appoint a, quote, safety controller who would be made liable for an offence if there were repeated and systemic failings. So a professional scapegoat. Interesting role. The idea has recently been pushed by the new digital secretary, Nadine Doris, who warned of potential prison sentences for serious offenders and that the planned two-year two grace period would end up being three to six months. So they want to speed this up. And you can understand why they want to speed it up, because technology moves so fast that within two years, all of the platforms will be completely different anyway. Uh, but of course, there is a free speech question here. Think Tank, the Adam Smith Institute, said the report fails to alleviate the gigantic threats posed by the draft online safety bill to freedom of speech, privacy and innovation. Three words which we don't hear very often these days. The report recommends removing a con controversial section dealing with legal but harmful content for adults, which critics had feared could lead to unintended widespread censorship. And I think they continue to fear that, so I don't know why the BBC is throwing in the old past tense there. Mm. I think that is a very real threat. Um, so I think there is a discussion to be had about the internet here. Um, I've personally of the opinion that social media has caused more damage to society than the atom bomb. 
Um, that's my spicy take for the day. That's why I don't use social media as much as I can. Um, I think that the most successful platforms are addictive drugs designed to hack into the human dopamine system and reduce users to habitually scrolling through advert-laden pages. There's also been a great deal of study on the, the effects of pornography on brain chemistry, and suffice to say, porn is just as addictive and destructive as many drugs and alcohol. Clearly, it's not a good idea for children to be interacting with this kind of stuff. But the question is really how you solve this problem. The internet is an ecosystem on multiple levels, and for me, the most effective way to child block the internet is to install controls at the point of access. So your smartphones, your computers, that sort of thing. Or just be an adult. Like, you're the one in charge of it, what mm -hmm. your kid interacts with. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For any parents out there, watch what your children are doing online. Be a parent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so South Korea tried blocking the points of access with its Smart Sheriff app, but bad implementation and bad coding led to the project being scrapped in 2015 due to hilariously large security flaws. It was basically an omnispy application which anyone could hack into very easily. It's a bit of a fail. Uh, but I think they were at least trying the right thing. The current approach to online safety, in quotation marks, is to police and regulate the internet itself to make it all child friendly. Um, this approach is immediately appealing to government because it extends state power into the online space. Instead of creating child-friendly access points, the entire internet has to be turned into a sanitized, child-friendly environment. Currently, the only way to reliably prove that the user is an adult is to require them to upload official ID, like you said before, with the wanker's passport or its other passport <laughs> and driving licenses. That's a good term. <laughs> um, not only does this indirectly abolish internet anonymity, because you have to put your official ID online, and, but it places sensitive personal data in the hands of irresponsible tech companies. Um, especially when we say irresponsible, let's remind ourselves that Facebook at least has no qualms when it comes to targeting its content at under 13s and 6 to 9 year olds. If we look at the next article, if we can look at the next clip, John. So if we scroll down, there's an image here. Can we scroll down, John? Down a bit, next one. There we go. Today, we only looked at customers above the age of 13, and we said to the younger people, don't use our service. But in the future, Facebook is going to be for everyone from the age of six upwards. We're going to target kids, we're going to target tweens, we're going to target early teens and later teens. Yeah, I don't trust these people. What about you? This is the other scorpion in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, yeah, we stopped targeting under 13 because, well, that's creepy as hell mm -hmm. and also probably illegal, yeah. but we'll just do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, there is something wrong with you if you're making that as your plans. Absolutely. It seems like they're trying to engineer society when you talk, look at some of their internal briefings. Yeah. It's very creepy. Um, so I thought I'd just finish off this segment with the chairman of the report and his comments on this legislation, which will be coming to us sometime in 2022 um, and reported by the Daily Mail, which has a an interesting article on this, which I wouldn't say is very useful, but it, the tone is amusing. Um, Tory MP Damien Collins is chairman of the Joint Committee on the Draft Online Safety Bill and has heard from victims, ministers, regulators and tech giants. He said, the committee were unanimous in their conclusion that we need to call time on the Wild West online. Wild West? I thought that had a long well, since it's long gone. <laughs> like, yeah. I think the Wild West is the fact that the tech companies are doing the content themselves rather than the, the regulating, mm -hmm. rather than the state. And the state's annoyed that that's not their power. Yeah, like, but if we want to put this in history, we have left the Wild West behind and it is now the oil barons who are running the internet. Uh, Facebook, Google, so on. Um, what's illegal offline should be regulated online. For too long, big tech has got away with being the land of the lawless. Well, no, it does have laws, its yeah. own laws, and they're tyrannical and arbitrary. In Britain, though, we even have more laws for online speech than offline speech. Yep. I mean, I, doing the email campaign, John will remember, because we were uh, selecting all the responses from MPs, the stock response from the Conservatives was, well, anything that's illegal on offline should be illegal online. I was like, no, grossly offensive speech is not illegal offline. Yeah. You're allowed to engage in that. Mm -hmm. Online, it becomes a crime. Mm. If Count Dankula had posted his video as a presentation in which he had jumped around and done it in front of his girlfriend, no problems whatsoever. Mm. But because he put it online, that was the crime. Yeah, and that's section 127 of the Communications yeah. Act that makes that a problem. It's um, also just factually wrong. But. And finally, he says, a lack of regulation online has left too many people vulnerable to abuse, fraud, violence, and in some cases, even loss of life. So again, you can see the framing devices using there. Either we have the nanny state or we have the oil barons of big tech. Pick your poison. 
If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to check out all the premium content we have on the site. Yeah, we've got loads and it's all really, really good. So why should you sign up? Why should you support us? Well, because you're going to get stuff that you don't get anywhere else. Like the cultural series that John and I have started, which is talking about the politics and philosophy of science fiction. Because everyone was demanding it. And John was like, let's do Star Trek. Okay. And everyone loved it. And they were like, okay, let's do Stargate. And he had never watched this. And so he's like, is this military propaganda? I'm like, no, it's, it's not military propaganda. It's basically a soap opera set in a science fiction setting. It's, but anyway, we've got really great stuff like that. And then we've obviously got our articles, which have got audio narration for the Silver Tier members, such as this anti-civilizational environmentalism by Hugo, as in, look at them. They want to actually erase civilization. And they're actually not very shy about saying it at this point. Uh, but anyway, moving on, we've got uh, interviews with absolute mad lads, such as Miles of Kabul that you did. Good guy. Did nothing wrong. <laughs> this, is, this is the guy who had to be <laughs> evacuated out of Afghanistan because he was on holiday there. Basically. Yeah, the funny thing is, like, there's loads of criticisms of him that are out there, but we just sat down and went through them, and none of them hold water. Hmm. So enjoy yeah, he seemed like a really nice guy, and he's he's got a really um, placid temperament. But like, he's not like some sort of raging lunatic or anything. I was really surprised. I expected him to be mad. But anyway, we've also got loads of uh, regular content, such as our book clubs. This is the Communist Manifesto that uh, Thomas and I recently did. It's very interesting, if you're not a communist, to read the Communist Manifesto, because there are, there are some telltale signs of conservatism that are embedded within it. I know that sounds hard to believe, but trust me, it's in there. Uh, anyway, moving on, we've got our spicy podcast that we can't put on YouTube. Can't carry on talking about that on this channel. Anyway, we've also got uh, the contemplations, this one that you did with Josh, talking about Parliament. Yeah, so Does this, it work? This is just a, an in-depth look at the system and where it comes from and why mm. it's a bit of a meme mm. as mentioned like the house of lords why does that exist it's literally just because like the the lords uh sorry the what is it the the burgesses and the priests and whatnot didn't want to sit with all the the barons and whatnot so they just separated into two groups in the king's chamber and then that became the two houses and yeah. that's how the system works yes amazing and uh finally we've got the epochs that bo and i do every week this was an amazing one. This is a life of General Gordon. And I'm really glad I get to juxtapose this with the interview with Miles of Kabul because the, you can see that these two characters, these two people are cut from exactly the same cloth. Like deeply Christian, like crazy adventurers, love living a life of danger. And the, the life of Gordon, Gordon of Khartoum is honestly a, a real thrill a minute. Uh, right now, I, I didn't know anything about me either. So Bo's taking me through what happened and I was just wrapped. I had such a great time. But anyway, there we go. Now, if you want to check us out on Alt Tech, be sure to follow us on Getter. So there's getter.com and the at there being lotuseaters underscore com because lotuseaters.com didn't work on the at, but it is the but You can't put dots in the yeah. at names. But but anyway, go and follow us on Getter. And uh, if you'd like to get access to all that premium content or all the free stuff we also have on the website, go to lotuseaters.com and subscribe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.